네, 안녕하세요. 실리콘밸리 코트라 마케팅의 임동규입니다. 오늘은 한국에 있는 IoT 그리고 의료기기 스타트업이 미국 시장 진출에 도움이 되는 유익한 정보들을 공유하고자 이 웨비나를 개최하였습니다. Hello, my name is Paul Lim. I am part of marketing team at Coltra Silicon Valley. Uh, today we invited Mr. Landon Merrill, a business development manager for Acorn Product Development, to talk about how to start and develop a IoT and medical technology business in the U.S. market. Good morning, Landon. Good morning, Paul. Thanks for having me. Could you tell us a little bit about Acorn's background? Sure. Uh, so Acorn was a company that uh, started as a result of our founders working at Next Computers uh, for Steve Jobs. They were uh, the mechanical engineering leads uh, there for the hardware. And uh, as you can imagine, as it, Steve Jobs is known for being design forward, um, everything there as far as the product development went was design first, engineering second. And uh, you can imagine when you get to manufacturing, if you haven't you know, put the engineering effort into making sure that it's uh, ready for manufacturing, it can present a lot of challenges. Uh, and so the founders became hyper aware of the need in the market and in uh, Silicon Valley for uh, the concept of design for manufacturing at every stage of product development. Uh, and so they decided to step out of Next Computers and start Acorn to provide that services uh, for Silicon Valley companies. And that's now led to national offerings and international offerings uh, over the last 27 years. And so it started just the two of them and now we have uh, five offices uh, across the globe. So. Uh, then could you tell us about the industries and companies does Acorn generally work with and how, do they, how does Acorn work with those clients? Sure. Um, our three main markets are healthcare, uh, which can be kind of considered as uh, anything that's healthcare and well-being products. Those could be consumer products or professional products. Um, they can be uh, federally regulated products like medical devices. Um, and then life science tools for research and diagnostics. Um, and then the third major market is robotics. Um, and then we also do a, a significant amount of work in consumer products, IoT, uh, FinTech, um, security, datacom, kind of everything else, industrial products like manufacturing equipment. Um, yeah, there's very few industries that we don't work in at this point. Um, and then the customer base is also equally as broad. Uh, we work with uh, Fortune 50 companies all the way down to startups um, and everybody in between. Um, you can imagine our office headquarters that are in the Valley, we work with a lot of startups locally as opposed to say our Atlanta or Boston branches work with more Fortune 50, Fortune 100 companies um, than they do startup companies. Um, but our company and our organization, the way we develop products is oriented to service uh, kind of everything in that spectrum. Uh, then what kind of value and competitive advantage and differentiation does Acorn offer to the Korean companies and manufacturers out there? Sure, so, um, you know, Acorn has a long history in the Valley. Um, we've been here for 27 years. Um, we have extensive network connections with investors, partners, vendors, uh, manufacturing suppliers. Um, we oftentimes are facilitating those relationships um, especially with companies that are coming into the domestic market for the first time. Um, that's a, obviously an extremely challenging thing to do for a lot of reasons, um, but one of those is coming to the marketplace and not knowing um, who you should be working with, who's going to facilitate manufacturing locally, who's going to facilitate marketing locally. Um, and you can imagine, uh, as we have oftentimes provided full lifecycle product development for customers, we've spent the last 30 years developing all of these relationships locally and internationally um, for all of those kinds of services uh, if we don't provide them. Um, depending upon the market that you're in, if you're in, say, medical devices, um, working with the right partners in that space are obviously critical to your success, right? Having the right manufacturer, um, having the right investment group if you're at that stage in your commercial um, maturity um, are critical for your success, right? And so oftentimes one of the things that we offer that is unusual is just uh, access to our network and facilitating those relationships. Now oftentimes that's not a, it's not something that we're, you know, it's not a business service for us, it's just something that we do for the community because it benefits everyone. Um, and it also ties us deeper into that network and that community as well, and that's always positive. Um, so there's, the first one is really just, just the network access, is understanding who the players are, who the people you need to be successful in that space. 
Um, the second is uh, probably that we offer you know a full suite of of, of offerings for um, you know, product development, whether it be you know just needing to change a product that's existent for a new market. Meaning, if say for example a product is coming from South Korea and wants to enter into the North American market. Um, the first thing you need to understand is the customer base that you're targeting and, and the differences and nuances between what the product has been built for and the, and the group of people that the product has been built for versus this new customer class, right? And understanding you know, what needs to change about the product and then obviously having to turn those needs and changes into reality. So taking the product that exists and making those modifications to make it accessible to the customer base that you're going after, in this case, you know, say the North American population. Um, understanding that market is really critical, right? And understanding those users is really critical. Um, and it's, it's a, in North America especially, a very challenging task because it's such a diverse population and such a diverse um, geographical, uh, you know, different cultures and different spaces in the country. Um, it's a lot to account for, right? Um, and so oftentimes we're, one of the values we're offering is kind of that very hyper-localization and understanding of the customer base and the different use cases that a product could be offered for. That's something that most product development engineering firms uh, don't really offer. It usually gets shopped out to a marketing firm. Um, but we found that in our experience having those folks in-house as a core uh, competency has been extremely beneficial to the product development lifecycle process. Uh, you obviously don't want to specify what a product needs to do or for who it uh, is to target uh, with those specific requirements and specifications and just kind of throw it over the fence to the engineers. They need to play back and forth um, because oftentimes you'll say the product needs to do X, Y, and Z and the engineering team will say that's really challenging to accomplish or impossible to accomplish. How can we, you know, um, how can we compensate or how can we um, you know, meet in the middle ground. And so having the ability to have them work hand in hand and balance those requirements to something that's accomplishable um, is really important you know, to having a successful product development life cycle. Um, so that's another way that we really differentiate ourselves. Can you share a successful story that you work with among companies uh, with Acorn? Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, one that comes to mind that's you know very uh, pertinent to the times that we're in right now is um, a company called Segura that's based out of Pleasanton, California. Um, this is a company that didn't exist at the beginning of the year. Okay. Um, it's a company that uh, was nucleated out of uh, a reaction to the pandemic. Um, they were a company that had some interesting ideas and some core technology that could be applied to helping us all kind of get back to a sense of normalcy um, and providing some safety and security around the workplace. And so what they came to us with was an idea uh, of a, a product that would ultimately constitute a social distancing tracking device. Uh, and so it's essentially a little fob about the size of a, an office card okay. um, that you wear. And what it does is it actually tracks your interactions with your coworkers and peers, um, how close they come to you. If they've breached their social distancing boundaries, say if you set it at six feet, it'll notify you that you spent too much time within that six foot window of uh, a peer, um, but then it also tracks all the people that you interact with in uh, a time period in, in your workday. And so it allows to help people understand what their social distancing behavior is in the workplace um, and reinforce good behaviors and uh, productive behaviors and then also it helps for contact tracing. Right. And so if there is a, um, an issue in the, in the workplace, if uh, someone does turn up say COVID positive or whatever the next thing is. Um, it's easy to quickly track who has had exposure to that individual um, and remove them from the environment and advise them to seek you know, health care. So um, that's a, an example of a product where there wasn't a need for this. There wasn't a, a real problem at the beginning of the year even. And a couple months in, there suddenly was a problem. Um, and so you know, we had to dive in really early, uh, really deep and quickly understand the problem. We had to characterize uh, the US population um, to say, what are your feelings about face masks, which is a highly contentious you know, topic in uh, the States, unfortunately. Um, and then social distancing is another kind of contentious topic. Um, and getting back to work is yet another contentious topic. And so we had to initiate a, a user um, investigation where we could go out into the market and understand um, societally, you know, by age, by demographic, um, by gender, by um, 
class by uh, you know what geographical region of the country you're in, what are the differences of how people feel about this stuff, um, in order to construct a product that would not um, you know have a, have a burden of being accepted by everyone, right? And so you can imagine in this example, um, what we discovered was that um, folks who are you know, very pro um, social distancing, very pro mask wearing, we're uh, very positive about the product and we're like, bring it in, I want it tomorrow, how do we get this, right? Um, whereas, uh, you know, the segment of the population that feels doubtful about uh, social distancing and face mask wearing, weren't super attracted to the idea of being, um, having their, their um, badge track, you know, how close someone was to them or not. What they did react positively to, though, was the idea that if someone became infectious, they could be told whether they had had any interaction with that person. And so, you know, in this case, what we were able to do was say, we have two customer segments that feel almost polar opposite about this highly controversial topic, um, and we're able to craft messaging and value propositions that allowed to, uh, the product to be appealing to both groups, right? So in this case, it was, we have these uh, evangelist customers who feel very good about social distancing and understanding what their behavior is. And so we could craft value products that says, hey, this is a, a product that helps you reinforce your social distancing behaviors. Um, and the folks that weren't so you know, excited about social distancing um, and we just wanted to get back to work, we crafted messaging that was basically, hey, if something happens, you'll be protected. You'll understand what your exposure level was. And they were very attracted to that. And so that's a good example of where we had to dive really deep in, understand the customer base, understand what their needs were, what the differences were in this particular society, um, and then craft product requirements and a product that was capable to service all of those folks. Um, and so then we built this product um, over the course of about three months, or designed it over the course of about three months. So we spent about a month doing uh, the user investigation so we could come up with a problem set and understand what the proper solution was. We spent about three months designing and developing the product. Um, we'll spend about a month and a half right now bringing it to a production ready state and we'll kick off production and a month later we'll have commercialization. So our entire product development life cycle um, will be about seven months for this product which is about less than half of what it would normally be for a product of this type. Um, again, you know, having a company be able to come to us with just an idea and say what's it going to take to get this to market as fast as possible is obviously a technology and a product that's super sensitive to timing. Um, and to the customer base, and being able to kind of holistically grab that customer base, um, do interviews, understand their concerns, construct requirements, design and build that product, get it into production, and get them ready for commercialization in seven months is obviously a, a Herculean effort, right? And so in this case, um, you know, it's an extremely successful program for us, um, and this product has already got a whole slew of customers lined up ready to go. Um, and a lot of that, again, is you know, us facilitating our network and saying we know exactly the types of groups that would be interested in this. So you can imagine manufacturing firms very interested in being able to get their folks back into the workplace in a safe and comfortable way. Um, and so this was a, another area where we were able to kind of make connections and help them kind of you know, understand this is your user base, these are going to be your clients, this is how we're going to build the thing that they want. Mm. Okay, so depending on the needs, you guys adjust to the timing and... Yeah, every, every product and every market is different, right? right. Um, and so we have to be extremely flexible. We have to have the right partners at you know, our back and call. We have to be able to dial up anybody that we need at a moment's notice. So we have to keep that network strong um, and make sure that we're always growing it. Um, and so in order for us to do that, uh, you know, we have to constantly be assessing every product and every um, relationship in a marketplace as if it's the first time we're doing it, right? Um, we oftentimes will get you know, similar products that come through the door that we're working on. We never treat them as like, oh, that's the same thing as we did a couple years ago, right? It's always, you gotta dive right back into it again and reassess all of that information and make sure that it's accurate before you go forward. Um, the way customers prioritize their work is always different too, right? Um, some customers, it's timeline, timeline, timeline. We don't care what the cost is. We don't care uh, you know, what the requirements are gonna need to be. We just wanna get this to market by this month or this year or this quarter, whatever it may be. Um, and so we'll change our program to accommodate the pace that they need to operate at, right? Um, sometimes it's, we want to do it, you know, as cheap as possible, and so it's, all right, well, let's make the program nice and lean, and we'll make it, you know, drawn out, and, and we won't parallelize, uh, parallelize a lot, and, you know, we'll try to keep the risk management as under control as possible, and de-risk the program as much as possible, um, and that way uh, we can tell you kind of exactly what this will cost to get through, and they can plan and, you know, moderate for that. 
um, other companies, it's feature set. How can we cram in as many features as possible? How can we make this as accessible as possible to as many people as possible? And those can be kind of more exploratory programs where we're coming up with lots of concepts and lots of different ways to solve the problem um, and then figuring out you know, ways to kind of build them all into the product offering. Um, so it, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Every client is unique, every product's unique, every market's unique, <laughs> right? So we have to be super flexible. Yeah. So given your company has developed and achieved many successful projects over the last 27 years, uh, could you tell us about the current and the future trends in related industries such as life sciences, medical healthcare, and cybersecurity? Yeah, sure. There's uh, obviously multiple trends, I think, that kind of thread through every industry. Um, those in particular, though, uh, have a high barrier of entry for professional usage. Um, you know, so you can imagine uh, the healthcare industry, life science research and tools, um, cybersecurity, healthcare products require uh, a disciplined background and education in that space um, to be useful. And so most of the products in those spaces are meant for professional usage. Um, that being said, there is a significant drive in, in, in those markets for democratization, which would be making them more accessible at a product level and a technology level to the average everyday consumer. Um, and so the, the idea there really is how do you take um, a product that is meant for an expert user and make it accessible to someone who's not an expert in that space, right? Um, and again, this kind of goes back to understanding your users, understanding how the product's used, what it's intended for, and in a way, you know, again, making it more accessible to those users uh, that you're targeting. Um, you can imagine that if the person's an expert user, uh, making it accessible is very easy because they understand the underlying technology, they understand how it works, they understand what they're trying to do with it. They oftentimes were involved in helping dictate how the product was designed or developed um, as a class of, of people. Um, but when you have a product like that and it, and it needs to be then kind of put into a consumer market, it has to be made much easier to use, it has to be made intuitive in, it, in its implication of how you use it and what you use it for. Um, and again, that's where that user experience, um, that user interface piece becomes extremely important um, because you have to understand who those folks are and what kind of messaging and indications would work with them in order to imply how to use the product. Um, ergonomics is actually a really uh, good example of an area where you can leverage that to imply how to use something. So the way a handle is designed, for example, gives you an indication of how to pick it up or how to use it, right? Um, something that has a pistol grip kind of handle means that the product is probably oriented across the top of your hand as opposed to something that looks more like a pen is more likely to be held up and you know vertically like this or like a pen itself. Um, and so using those kinds of indications in the, the way that it's designed um, can oftentimes implicate how you would actually use the product. And so those kinds of tricks become really important in um, communicating to the customer how to use something if they're not an expert. So democratization, um, again, as a, as a high level trend is something that um, you see very commonly. Um, and again, you know, in order to enable that, you have to understand those users and understand what their, you know, I don't want to say education level, but what their understanding of the discipline and the technology is that is being, it's being used for, um, and then accommodating that, making it as intuitive as possible. Um, another common trend amongst all of those is, uh, I would say, kind of hyper-localization. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, any product that has to, um, be sold domestically or internationally. Uh, you kind of build it for the market you know and the market that is in front of you and the market you're initially targeting. Um, and if you're a South Korean company, you might design the product to service uh, South Korean uh, user base. Um, but then if you want to expand upon that and bring it out to the global market, um, you need to understand those markets you're going to. Um, kind of counterintuitively, what you want to do in that circumstance is globalize the product, make it as kind of ubiquitous as possible to the global market and then hyper-localize it for certain regions, certain areas that you plan on targeting. Um, and again, that's another area where, uh, again, you have to kind of dive into those users and really understand them um, and get an understanding for those little nuances and differences that you'll have to tweak on the product for each of those regions to make them successful. A product that is extremely successful in North America will not necessarily be extremely successful in the Nordic region, right? Um, and so you have to kind of accommodate those differences. Uh, so you can kind of see, even in those two trends, there's a, there's a common theme of um, really diving into the user experience, really understanding your customer base, 
Um, and, and that again is kind of a maybe a, a super high level uh, trend that has been building for the last decade and a half. But I think right now is something that um, everyone is really starting to try to understand better. Um, for Acorn, we've been doing that forever. Our design team, that's what they were founded in. Um, they were actually a, a spin out from Siemens Healthcare, um, became Elemental 8, which is based in San Jose right across the street, and um, then merged with Acorn a couple years back. And one of the things that they have been industry leaders in forever is um, really diving into the user experience and helping that uh, process to define what the problem set is for a product, and then ultimately what the solutions are that need to be delivered. Uh, so really defining the product through the customer base um, as opposed to this is the technology, this is what we know how to build, so we're going to build this thing, right, and then see who wants it, um, which is, doesn't sound uh, like the wisest thing, but is very common. <laughs> Do you have any closing statements, especially for our Korean uh, companies right now who's viewing the webinar? You know, I would say North American market is um, very accepting of um, international technologies, especially from South Korea. Um, South Korea is, you know, known in America for its superb engineering education system, um, for its technology, uh, for ground, you know, again, groundbreaking technologies that get uh, matriculated into, into our industries. Um, I would never hesitate to, you know, reach out to the North American markets and try to understand them better and build for them, frankly. Um, you know, I in the last year have interacted with um, a half a dozen South Korean companies that, you know, have found incredibly novel solutions for existing spaces with new technologies that are cheaper, better, easier to manufacture, easier to integrate into products. Um, and those are the things that are really important to our customers in the North American market, um, where they come to us and look for you know, an understanding of, hey, I want to integrate this capability like an infrared camera. Who should I be looking at, right? Who are the, who the main suppliers in this space? Um, we always check to see what's going on in South Korea because uh, there's always really interesting technology development going on there. And uh, it's often a, at a significant technological and strategic advantage to uh, work with those firms. Um, so I would say, you know, if, if, you, if you have a good technology, North America should be a primary market for you. <laughs> um, and if you need introduction into that space, you know, and, and to understand it better, um, Acorn can certainly help with that, you know, and make those connections. Thank you, Landon, for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Paul. And we'd also like to thank all the viewers in Korea right now. I uh, hope this time was informative to many IoT and medical technology companies that want to start exporting in the U.S. market. Uh, 시청해주셔서 감사합니다. 다음에 또 좋은 정보와 서비스로 찾아뵙겠습니다.